Welcome to the live stream. Today I'm answering questions on federal government jobs on usajobs.gov, the federal hiring process, any and all jobs revolving around federal employment. First, I'm gonna be answering the questions that were previously submitted. I'll look into the chat and see if we have any questions there. First question, Gina Henderson, who asks, I'm qualified for jobs, but because of special considerations, I'm not getting a lot of referrals. Do you think I should focus only on direct hiring authorities if I have no veterans preference or disability? And the answer is yes. You should first focus on direct hiring authority, the jobs that have direct hiring authority. And second, I would look into the virtual hiring events. So let's jump on USA Jobs right now and I'll show you what I mean. Speaking of USA Jobs, they changed their website. So as you can see here, the graphic has changed. If you spent any time on usajobs.gov, you can see clearly the graphic has changed. And on the upper right-hand corner, we have events. This is for hiring events. If you scroll down, they also have done a better job with uh, what jobs can you apply for. So they talk about the hiring paths here. If you go all the way down, there's a huge graphic that says explore the latest job fairs and events. This is their hiring their uh, hiring event section. So if you click more events, you can see through here, you can select the filter. If you are in an area that's not near a major city, I would go ahead and put online as the location. And you can look through here, they have different hiring events that you can attend. So I would attend those. Now with direct hire, they still do not have a filter for direct hire. So when you go to USA Jobs and you do a search, you would type in direct hire and then run a search right now you'll see there's over 2,000 jobs for direct hire you can scroll down a lot of times in the title it'll say direct hire authority what you would do with this is first you would input your filters so exactly what hiring path are you qualified for what job series are you looking for what agency would you like to work for put those filters in first and then type direct hire then save the search that's what i would do and this looks different too. So when they changed the website recently, probably about two or three days ago, they changed this part as well. When you look at it, the first thing that you see on the upper right hand corner, it says remote work jobs. So previously there were two filter tabs. It was filters and more filters. Now it just shows all the filters in one tab. And I think this is a little bit of a mistake because hiring path is the fourth one down you would want to select your hiring path first. If you're just jumping on usajobs.gov and you're searching for anything, say you're an accountant and you're just typing an accountant, or you're an analyst or you're typing an analyst, that's gonna bring up everything. And you might not be eligible to apply for all the jobs. So you want to select your hiring path first. If you don't have any special hiring path, you're gonna click open to the public. There's over 11,000 jobs right here, open to the public. But the distinction, the difference is in the old website, this hiring path, it was the very first thing that you saw. Now, it's not the first thing, it's the fourth thing. You have to click down in order to use it. Another change, they have mission critical career field. So this is different, they didn't have this before. And most of these right here, they're gonna have incentives. They could be in direct hire, they could offer bonuses. So if you're eligible, if you have the right experience, I would pay attention to that as well. Okay, so that covers pretty much the new changes. Let's go ahead and switch back. Next question, God's favor, who asks, I'm qualified for jobs, but because of special considerations, I'm not getting a lot of referrals. Do you think I should focus? That's the same question. Next question, God's favor, is it possible to find out the hiring manager's name of a department that's hiring and email him or her directly about being interested in the job, or should I take the proper steps through the chain of command? I wouldn't reach out directly to the hiring manager unless you already have a pre-existing relationship where you guys were communicating. And that could happen if you attend a virtual hiring event. You could end up with the hiring manager's email and you could be going back and forth with them. Outside of that example, your main point of contact is going to be human resources. And you're not even gonna hear from them until after you have gone on the interview. So you go on the interview and then you're keeping in contact with HR. More often than not, you're not even discussing anything with the hiring manager until after the final job offer and you're reporting to them because they're your supervisor. So 
I would keep applying on usajobs.gov until you start getting interview requests. Go on those interviews. Next question. From Evans Wonderland, who asks, my strategy since I'm willing to relocate anywhere is sorting by closing soon so I get an answer sooner. Is this strategy good or bad? I think it's good. I think it's good not just for you. I think it's good for most people. And I'll show you what I mean. So back on usajobs.gov, once you input, let's say you're just starting your job searching campaign right now. You get on USA Jobs, you're putting in all your filters. So you're starting up here with hiring path. You're open to a public candidate. Maybe you're a veteran. Let's click veteran. Maybe you're a recent student grad. Okay, so we click three hiring paths. You did that part. The next thing that you want to do, let's say you're looking for a specific series, you know that you have a lot of administrative experience, so you're gonna look for 0301, okay? So you have that filter. And then you have your location. I don't know, where do you think? Chicago? Let's say Chicago, nothing wrong with Chicago. Okay, so we have all these filters in. What you want to do at this point, if you're just starting your job searching campaign, you click sort by and you sort by close date. And the reason that you're doing this is so that you do not miss any opportunities that could be closing very soon. This one right here, the first job that pops up at the DOE, that closes tomorrow. So we're applying today because tomorrow when it closes, we're not going to have that opportunity. This is what I recommend everyone do. As soon as you realize that you want a federal government job, you have your resume squared away and you start searching for jobs, sort by close date. So you can go ahead and jump on those opportunities before they close. There are a lot of other filters. You can sort by open date, agency, department, et cetera. However, the best strategy I believe is close date. So yes, I think that's a good strategy. All right, let's get rid of that. All right, let's go jump into the chat, see what we have in the chat. Good morning, Parlor. Thank you for joining me. Good morning, MC. Tyler Simmons. Good morning. Is it hard to get fired from a federal government job during probation? How can you not get fired during probation? I would say if you were to categorize it on difficulty level, I would say it's probably a little bit difficult. Because the majority of the time, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So if you don't know something, if you mess something up, if you're not familiar with a process, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Everyone understands you're the new person. You're the new person in the new cubicle, and they're going to be rushing over there to assist and to help. As long as you have a good attitude, a good demeanor, and you show up. If you do not show up, if you're late, habitually multiple times if you have a negative attitude then it becomes easier to envision a situation where you're getting fired but <clears throat> more often than not i would say it's more difficult to get terminated than if you were in the private sector even though you're still at will for the first 12 months or 24 months whatever your probation timeline is you're still an at will employee during that time i would say it's more difficult i think new federal employees worry about this this particular question entirely too much 85 95 percent or more are able to get out of probation with no issues <clears throat> good morning ian what do we got good morning ryan morning is it harder to get another job out of your state no it's not so your federal resume has your address on it sometimes it doesn't have to but even if you're, let's say you're in Alabama or you're in North Dakota, you have your, your city or your region or your state, they're not looking at that. When you apply to a job, the assumption is you're willing and you're able to move. So if that's not the case and they offer you the job offer and there's no relocation um, reimbursement, then you would say you would decline it. But it, it's not harder simply because you're not located in that geographical area. Good morning, TB. Good morning, Ian. Ian, again, if you get selected for a direct hire interview and do well, does that mean you get the job? What will determine if you get the job or not? Let's say you did well on the interview. The, that, the result of the interview, basically you doing well, that result goes to HR. HR is responsible for 
vetting, basically ensuring that this is a legal hire. So if there's any requirements for that job that the hiring manager didn't pick up, HR is going to double check and make sure that all the T's are crossed, all the dot I's are dotted and make sure that it is legal to hire you. So then the job offer will come towards you. You will get an email notification. Sometimes you'll get it through the phone. Good morning, Brian. It looks like IRS is mandating a 50% return to office for non-bargaining units. How likely do you think this will impact bargaining units? The IRS tele telework policy is what's attracting new candidates. I agree with you, Brian. I do think this is one of the main drivers when it comes to federal agencies, period, is the telework possibilities. And a lot of agencies in and around DC right now, they're allowing their folks to, to telework like four days a week. They come into the office one day a week or at most two days a week, there are some agencies that are requiring two days a week, but then the other three days, you're able to work from home. So do I think it will impact bargaining units? Yes, I think it will ultimately impact. And what, what the unions will do is they will file a grievance depending on a lot of things, right? But I know some unions in the area have filed a grievance when it comes to showing up uh, two times or more throughout the week. So yeah, this has been a whole thing, you know, for, for over the past year now. What are we doing? Okay. Next question. Brian. Oh, no, I skipped somebody. Freedom Creek. Good morning. I'm in a GS position appointed by direct hire about four months ago. Am I limited to only applying for direct hiring authority promotional opportunities until I have 52 weeks of timing grade in my current position? Thank you. Okay, so you are a GS federal government employee. I don't know what service you're in, competitive service, accepted service. Regardless of that, you're not, you don't have to wait 52 weeks necessarily. So if you're in a position and you do not have 52 weeks time and grade, and you're a federal government employee, you you can always look at open to the public job opportunities. So you can look at open to the public job announcements. And if your past experience, excluding your current government job, your past experience qualifies you, then you can use that in order to get a higher GS grade or another government job. People do that all the time. All right. Brian, after interview, how long should you wait before following up? After an interview, I would give it three weeks. Three weeks, you hear nothing, I would respond to the individual that set up the interview and I would ask kindly for a status update. And I would continue to do that every three weeks until they finally tell you that you were not selected or that you were selected. If they're not telling you for a long period of time, the majority of the time, it means that you were not selected, unfortunately. Good morning, Fitness Boost. Good morning, Tyler Simmons. Why do some jobs prevent people from signing up to be part of a union? Well, so the government jobs, if you look at the job announcement, it'll tell you if you're eligible or not to be a part of the union. And it's like a distinction between leadership and management between the actual worker. So the majority of leadership positions in a lot of agencies will not allow them to be part of the union. If you're in a specific job in an office, that has more of a kind of like a leadership role to that office, like a headquarters. If you're in headquarters, there could be some offices in there that, you know, they're not gonna allow you to do it. Um, it's gonna it's gonna vary. But if it's important to you, I would very I would highly recommend that you read the job announcement to ensure that this is a collecting bargaining position or it's not. Fitness boost. I've had three interviews in the past two months, but I haven't heard from HR yet. The interviews went well. I'm still applying to multiple jobs in the past two months. Yeah, I would definitely follow up with all three of those since it's been two months and you're doing the right thing by continuing to apply. So many people, so many times, they they have an interview or two and they're just waiting for the result and they stop applying. And then what could end up happening is the budget could get cut or they could not get selected because there's another, there's a better candidate or a better person that they interviewed. And then they're, they had to start all over again after they finally hear back two or three months later that they weren't selected. So it's good that you're continuing to apply to those jobs. All right, let me go ahead and jump over to the previously submitted questions. And what do we have? All right, next, next, next question is from FL Girl, I guess that's Florida. I would like to know the process from being referred to interviewing and what length of time. I wish I could give you an exact timeline, but there's over 400 federal agencies 
There's tons of different HR offices, so you're going to have a lot of difference between each one of them. In general, when it comes to hearing back from a referral, I would put the number roughly between one and three weeks after applying. It could be longer than that. And then hearing, hearing back from an interview after you've been referred, I would say probably roughly speaking two to six weeks. Now, once again, it can happen sooner or it can happen later. The best thing that you can do is control what you control. And what you control is applying to government jobs. You control every time you click on a job announcement and click apply. That's what you control. Focus on that. Continue to pump out the volume. That's what I would tell you. Next question. Do you have Discord? Man, that text is huge. Do you have Discord? No, I don't have Discord. I, I messed around with Discord a little bit, and then I was like, hey, I don't have time for Discord. I do have, I have a Patreon. I have a newsletter. If you want to ask me a question, when you think of a question, or regardless of the circumstance, what some people have been doing is replying directly to my newsletter, and that comes into my inbox, and I try to answer as many as those, as many of those questions as I can. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you. If, you, if you're not on the newsletter, the newsletter is free, and I would recommend you signing up for the newsletter. So this is, where is it? There it is. Okay, so the newsletter is like this, right? There's some news, current events, some tips, and then at the bottom, the main thing is there's virtual hiring events. Now, I just showed you virtual hiring events on usajobs.gov, but there are times where agencies are not putting that information on usajobs.gov. This happens with the Border Patrol. This happens with, um, what was it, NSA. Some of the three-letter agencies, they don't put their job events on usajobs.gov. So I go ahead and I, in Peace Corps too, a lot of times the Peace Corps doesn't do it. And who else? There's another one that doesn't do it. TSA maybe. So th these are upcoming virtual hiring events. This is tomorrow, Peace Corps recruiter, the day after tomorrow, USDA. Then after that, this is not even a government agency, but there will be federal agencies present. Bender Consulting Services, have you heard of them? They're going to have federal government agencies there. So there's different hiring events that you can get, and I email it out every week. So if you're not signed up to the newsletter, sign up to the newsletter. Okay, that's enough of a, of a plug on that. All right, let's see, what else? Okay, next question. We got one here from Nar Niral. Who asks, I have a bachelor's in business administration and 13 years of experience of being self-employed in retail business. What would be the best job series to apply to? Good question. A question that I see often. Let's go to USA Jobs. This is what you should do, in my opinion. Look at that. USA Jobs is down. Well, there goes that idea. All right, so... Every now and again, as you might know, usajobs.gov does go down. What you should do is look at the 1100 series. That's the business series. 1101, specifically. 1101. And it could be some other ones in there as well. You'll have, uh, you'll have acquisition specialists. You will have uh, business development specialists. You'll have outreach and marketing. And since you're an entrepreneur, you've been doing your own business there is a lot of administration that goes along with running a business. So you could be eligible for a lot of the administrative job series as well. Zero 0300, if you focused on your budget for your business, your finances, you could look at 0560, that's a budget analyst. There's many positions that you could be eligible for depending on your exact experience. So I would start there. Let's see. What do we got, what do we got? We got, so let's go to the comments. Uh, what is this? Okay, Morgan Jones. Good morning. I'm a GS8 employee with a master's degree, and now I have a Schedule A. How can I market the Schedule A? I'm interested in CDC, D, Department of Labor, and the Veteran Affairs. How can you market this? All right. So you're a GS8 employee now. How long have you been a GS8? 
I don't know how old you are or how much experience you have, but let's say hypothetically you have 15 years of experience. You've been a GSA for two, two or three years. You can take your past experience, use a Schedule A, which grants you non-competitive hiring authority, and you can start applying for Schedule A jobs, or you can start applying for open to the public jobs, not worry about time and grade, target something more appropriate for your experience level. That's one way you can do it. You can also reach out to a Schedule A coordinator if you haven't done this already, in your local area or an area you're willing to move and you can have them start working on your behalf as well send them your schedule a letter send them your resume tell them exactly what job series you're eligible for based on your experience and you can work it that way as well so that's what i would do uh, but there's there's a lot of missing information i can, to give you specific more specific advice all right next question the yupa k hello are there any dead giveaways that we could tell during an interview that we're not getting the job? I had a Teams meeting interview with VA last week. Not really dead giveaways, because there are many stories of people who go in thinking that they bombed an interview, meaning that they did horrible, and then the next day or the next couple of days, they actually get a job offer. So there's not going to be dead giveaways. Another reason why is during the interview, usually they're very cold and dry it's like talking to a computer so you can't really get any any nonverbal communication signals indicating their interest or not so you're just going to get a lot of nodding and it's gonna it's gonna feel weird um, but what i would recommend just like i recommended the last person keep applying while you're waiting to hear back all right next question Freedom Creek, great discussion. Do you recommend using formal job titles or functional job titles on the resume for positions held in the private sector? Uh, you could do both, but more often than not, I would just lean towards the formal job title. So if you're you know, an assistant director of operations, I would just go ahead and put that. And um, you can, what you wanna do really is just focus more so on the achievements, regardless of what your title is. You can have a specific title, but not do any of those type of tasks. So your title is one thing, but your actual achievements and your responsibilities and what you were able to do in that position, that's gonna matter so much more than just a job title. All right, next question. Why is the pay gap so small between GS 14 and 15 compared to GS 13 and 14? Um, why is it so small? I really don't know the answer to that. You, let's pull it up and see. It should be roughly the same. The thing with GS 15, is that it caps out especially if you're in um, a major metropolitan area so check this out so this is the gs pay scale in dc and you see right here right about uh, close close to g to step six okay, let me make this bigger for you so you can see closer to step six really step seven but pretty much step six it maxes out at 15. but um yeah, what do we got here? This should be a set percent. We got 117. This is basically the 140. 140 to 160, so that's 20K. And that's uh, 20. Yeah, it's about 20K. It's roughly 20K, you know, give or take a few K. So the, the main reason I could see for your point being would be it maxing out completely. So if you're looking at the higher step levels, there's going to be a huge disparity because there's only 10K difference between a step 10 GS14 and a step 10 GS15. And this number will go up. Uh, any time that there's a pay raise. So that, that little 2% pay raise they're talking about, this is gonna go up to like 195, 196. All right, interesting, interesting question. Let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that. Next question, the Yupoko K. If references were contacted a day after the interview, is that standard procedure for some agency or is that a good sign? That is a good, strong indicator. It's a good sign. I would say that puts your, your odds roughly at 75%. I think it's really good. Not all agencies do that. Now, if you're telling me this is the DOD, the DOD in recent experience, they are more likely to just do everyone's references. <laughs> but more, more, more agencies, I would say, are only doing it in the top two, three candidates. And some agencies only do it for one candidate. Usually the smaller agencies, they'll just do it to the top candidate. And if they get a, a poor reference from the top candidate, then they'll go to the second candidate. So overall, good sign. You should get it. That's what I would say. You should get it. All right, next question. Ryan, good morning, Ryan. 
I was hired as an intern GS7. It came with a 52K bonus for four years. Well, congrats on that bonus. I'm sure that was taxed like super heavy. I did a good job within the first six months. I was offered a permanent position, which is equivalent to GS12 and 13. Well, hey, that just sounds like a success story. Congratulations, Ryan. Next, uh, Daniela. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you for your advice. I just got a GS13 job. I will start in a week. Your advice is great. I recommend your channel. That's amazing. That's a good, that's a wonderful success story. Congratulations on the new job. BW, I'm currently paying 0.8% into FERS. That means you probably were a federal employee 2013 or before. Will I keep paying the same percent or will it go if I transfer? I, okay. I, first, let me just tell you, I don't know, but I think you would keep your 0 0.8 because you were, if you look at your service computation date, it is before 2014. 2014 and above, if you were hired 2014, so the last 10 years, if you just became a government employee, then you have a 4.4 deduction when it comes to your first, your retirement, your pension. Resilient, the worst interview turned out to be at my full-time job. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you for bringing that up, Resilient. I felt I did awful, but they said I was the best candidate. That happens a lot of the times. All right. Oh, we got a super chat. Can't pronounce your name, but hey, thank you so much for giving me the super chat. Uh, hey, I have a JD MBA with three years working experience. What GS level job positions do you recommend? So with business, if you're looking for a job that requires a business degree, then you, you would look at 1102 because 1102 requires a business degree and that's dealing with contracts. 1101 is business in general. And that's where most of the business jobs are in that job series, 1101. What's more important than your JD or MBA? What's more important is what did you do for those three years? And I'm going to make an assumption and I'm going to, I'm going to say you did something that was heavy on administrative tasks. You did a lot of admin type work. If that's true, if you have three years of administrative experience, then I would start at 0301 or 0303. So 0301 or 0303. You can also look at administrative officer, but I don't have your resume in front of me. I cannot see exactly what you did in that office because 0343 could also be an option. If you did maybe some teaching, maybe it wasn't behind the desk clerical work, but maybe you did something like assistant instructor, something like that, then 1700 would be a job series that you can explore, curriculum development. So it's going to depend a lot more on your experience than your education. The only time it really focuses in on your education is if you're in a job series that requires it. So like I was talking about earlier, 1102, you could do 1102, but that would have you coming in at probably GS7 or GS9 at the highest. If we could take those three years of working experience and make a compelling case of you having the necessary experience to get a higher level GS grade, then I, I would imagine it could probably come in GS9 at the highest I would say probably GS 11, depending on your area. If it's a major metropolitan area, if you're outside of Washington, DC, New York city, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, if you're outside of a big city, GS 11 would be probably, you know, in the mix, but I would have to look at your resume. Thanks. Thanks once again. Happy Easter shimp. Thanks for being back in here. Uh, let's see. BW, I heard if you take family leave, there's an agreement of service that you have that you have to work after you come back. What is that about? What happens if you transfer to another agency? If you take family leave, there is an agreement of service that you have to work. Hey, I don't know the answer to that. I would I would check with HR on that one. And most of these concerns that you're having once you're already a federal government employee, I would definitely your first stop should be HR. Celine Carey, good morning. Can the average person create their own resume in your opinion? Yes, they absolutely can. People are charging two to $400 for federal resume. Is that price worth it or is it exploitation? Okay, so there's people that charge over $1,000 in the DC area for a federal resume. Is that exploitation? I mean, you can make a, a case for it. It's gonna come down to the individual. Is this worth it to me? If it's not, don't buy it. If it is, then buy it. If you buy it and you have buyer's remorse, it, 
then it wasn't worth it. But if you bought it and it got you a GS7, a GS14 job, then it was worth it. So I think the average person, I think I would say 90% of people can write their own resume. In fact, I encourage people to write their own resume. The bad part about this is sometimes people do not understand the difference between a private sector and a federal resume. And the main difference is just the information you're including and you're being more detailed and descriptive. You're actually telling exactly how you accomplish a task. You're not just saying, hey, I was responsible. I was responsible for some office work. There were five people there. I supervised them and that's it. You're not telling them that. You're giving them exactly, hey, I, I reviewed policy. I looked at the SOP. I pulled this information out. I applied it. There was a gap. I identified it. I analyzed it. I pulled up Microsoft Excel and I was able to use this information and this is the result. I'm going to give you my result. Take the result. This is what I did. And people are not being that descriptive. So what I've done, I have example resumes that are written up in that fashion. So they're written in a compelling way that showcases results. So if someone needs help with that, I think it's like $20, $25. There's a link in the description below. You can click federal resume examples and you can look at that for different job series. That has helped people. But I do believe if you watch, I, I would say, I don't know, four or five of my videos, you would get the idea and you would have enough information to apply it. Everything out there on the internet is free. Everything is free. You can go and look for it. If you have enough of the initiative, you can go and find something. Now, one of the reasons people pay money for it is to save time. It's a very time consuming process. A lot of people don't like to write, period. And that's why people will pay. And what's really sad is when people pay hundreds of dollars and they have a resume that's still written in a poor format. That's not, not giving, not getting them any refers referrals or not getting them any interviews. So that's what I would say, Celine. I would say that. Shemp, how common is it to literally think you are incompetent at your job? <laughs> uh, boss says you're doing great. Give yourself some time. Very common, Shemp. Give me a second. Mm. incredibly common when you first get a federal government uh, job you're sitting in the chair you're at work you're in your cubicle you're in your office i would say the majority of people are feeling like what am i doing here <laughs> like Im imposter syndrome like how am i getting paid six figures what am i doing here it takes a while it takes a while it's like drinking from a fire hose it takes a good long while for you to learn the acronyms, learn the people in the organization, learn the process, develop your own internal process in order to help improve what was already pre-existing. And that's another problem. When you go in there, when you go into the agency, a lot of the systems are not documented. So you're like, what is going on? And then if, they, if there are systems that are documented, then they're, they're ancient, they're old, they're not being used. So then you have to start developing systems. It's common, I would say, it would take you at least probably two years. Once you're in the job for two years, you're gonna start feeling more competent. So don't worry about that. It's good that you're keeping that open channel communication with your supervisor, because that's gonna be huge when it comes to getting a promotion or getting performance awards at the end of the year. A lot of federal employees, depending on your agency, you can get a couple thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars at the end of the year. Um, BW, just curious, what do you do, Armand? What is your GS? How long did it take you? Um, you can find you can find out my information if you go on LinkedIn. I'm not going to talk about myself that much, but if you go on LinkedIn, I have a profile there. It's public. You can see you can see what I do and you can see my experience. Ike SK, if you get a job in a new agency, will your time off get transferred? Yes. If you also go to private and try to come back later with service time in Time in government agencies count towards your experience. Yes. So if you quit your government job right now and you go to the private sector, you have an option to cash out your leave and that will be taxed. Or you could just save it. And then, you know, you would save it if you know that you're coming back into the government and then you could have all that back. 
your time in the government is calculated on your SF-50. It's usually calculated by the service computation date. So it keeps track of exactly how much time did you serve. So let's say you want, you're trying to get your five-year pension, but you spend two years in a government job. You quit. You decide you want to go work at Facebook or Google. You work over there for 10 years. You come back. You only have to do three more years, and then you hit the five years, and then you're eligible for a pension. That's an example. So your time does count. It is saved. All right. What do we got next? Morgan Jones, master's degree in public administration, 12 years with SSA, Schedule A, over 15 years. So we're talking about 27 years of experience total. I don't see a question though. Okay, Morgan. All right, let's see. Freedom Creek, should we collectively or individually list every inline promotional title we ever had a single employer? If it's a single employer, I would just pick your, your last promotion. And then your achievement bullets can speak towards other positions if you want to, to showcase it. But I would just do the last promotion. So if you were in, I don't know, let's say you were in Bank of America. And then you were a teller. And then you were a uh, assistant manager. You were a manager. And then you're a store you know, director or whatever, I would just put director and leave it at your last position that you were promoted. It could depend, you know, exactly on your situation. If you're trying to showcase different job titles because it's directly relevant to the to the job announcement for a federal government job, then that could that could change. But generally, I would just mention the last time you were promoted. Um, Mr. Z, good morning. During a medical review, they requested my psychiatric notes. I'm currently diagnosed with PTSD. I feel like CBP is doing extra. I feel like a victim of discrimination. Well, let's see what they say when they uh, when it comes back. But C CBP, that's probably a clearance job. If you don't want people digging into your medical records, I would look at government jobs that do not require a clearance. So the majority of them do not require a clearance. Actually, let's go ahead and jump on USA Jobs. Well, let's see if it's if it's open. Last time we tried this, it was down for maintenance. Usually when it's down for maintenance, it stays down for a while. But nope, it's up. Okay. So check this out. Go here. Search. Scroll down. Clearance. Right now, there's about 8,000 government jobs today that have no secret clearance requirement. And 3,000 that do. And 600 that have top secret. I'm not sure what job that you apply to where they're trying to dig up your medical, but I'm willing to wager it's probably top secret or SCI, or it could be secret, but that's less common with secret, but it could be secret. If it's not required or confidential, so over 8,000 jobs, they wouldn't be digging into your medical records. But it is intrusive. I have sat through a top secret clearance process and I understand how it can feel. Uh, you definitely feel like, um, <laughs> you feel like you did something wrong. I know that feeling. Okay. Let's get rid of that. All right. What else do we got? All right. We have Edward, Edward Lee. I live in Los Angeles, California. Should I apply city, county, California, state, or federal? Some people told me the pay and benefits of city and state are better. That could be the case. Why not apply to all of them? I would look like, what do you want to do? What's your experience? What's your education? What do you want to do? If you want to work, let's just say administrative, let's say you want to be an administrative specialist because I don't know what you want to do. Look at your city and see how much they pay. What are their benefits? Look at county, state, and look at federal. I know federal pays pretty well. And on average, most people will say federal pays more, but you're in California and California plays by their own rules. So there, there are cities, man, there was this one city, I forget where it's at, but there's a guy I talked to, he only worked for five or six years in his city doing recreational type stuff. Like he was setting up for baseball games. And after five years, he had a pension that he was able to draw immediately. He was still in his forties, his early forties. And he was drawing a small pension of like 600 a month. And he was in the military also couldn't believe it. But yeah, there are some cities that have those type of benefits. And you have to go in there, do the research, look on your city's webpage, look on your county's webpage and see exactly those pay, those pay scales should be public and you should be able to find that information. But my, my first inclination is why not all apply for all of them? Uh, um, next question, SD, when you select only remote work jobs and get hired for one, how is training conducted? Do you have to travel to the agency or is it done online? 
This depends, but the majority of the time it's done online. Most of the training in government is done online. Now, if you are 1102, they are gonna send you somewhere to get training. And there's other job positions, especially a lot of them in the accepted service and the Department of Justice, where you're gonna have to go on site to get some training. Uh, next question, Ryan, how does a top secret clearance raise salary? It doesn't raise salary, not in the federal government. Now, in the private sector, if you wanna be a defense contractor, it can make a more compelling, you could be a more compelling hire to a defense contracting agency by having a top secret clearance, but it's not gonna raise your, it's not raising your salary in the government. Next question, SD, if an agency says five pages only, should you include your schooling within the five pages? I would, because your schooling is only gonna take a few lines. So I would at least put your last degree that you earned at a minimum, but I would include the whole thing. When it comes to five pages, um, most people's resumes these days, I think should be five pages. You want the first page to be the most compelling, the most strongly written, high flying achievements that are directly relevant to the job. That's what you want the first page to communicate. Look through your resume and look at the bullets and the achievements that you have in there. And then ask yourself the question, how does this relate to the job? If you're applying for a financial specialist and you have a bullet in there about, I don't know, the time that you trained four or five people on a certain task, ask yourself the question, does this bullet, how does it relate to the job announcement I'm about to apply to? If it doesn't, then I would get rid of it. And I would keep doing that until you have five pages. Or if you have over 10 years of experience, I would start cutting the years. So anything further back in your history is not gonna be as relevant because it's, it's older. So it's done on older software using older techniques. So I would remove some of the older experience. All right, next question. Hi, I applied for a role for the FDIC. I was told I'm not within reach to be referred. What does that mean? I never heard it phrased that way. Yeah, that's a unique way of phrasing it. So there was a cutoff line. So let's say the cutoff was any, everybody with 90 points or higher was referred and you have 85 points. So you were not within reach, <laughs> meaning 85, you're not, you're not hitting the 90 point uh, thresh, threshold. The 90 point threshold was here and you're 85. So you didn't have enough points. That's what that means. It just means you're not referred. You weren't found best qualified. That's what they should have said to you. You were not found best qualified. Okay. Eldridge, how long can it go from conditional job offer to final job offer with the Department of Defense? How long can it go? It can go months. But I think within reason, I would say reasonable, eh, probably four to six weeks. But it could take months. It depends on what the agency is doing. There's three holdups, right? HR holds things up. The security team holds things up. And the hiring manager holds things up. So as long as those three are not holding anything up, I would say four to six weeks, maybe earlier if you're lucky. All right, El Edward, I'm 50 years old, is it too late? No, it's not too late. There was just somebody in their early 60s that received a final job offer a couple of weeks ago. You're not too old, 50 years old is not too old at all. You just, you just need to develop the strategy, right? Ed, I'm Edward. I'm in Nebraska. I'm in Kansas. Wherever you're at, this is my location, 30 mile radius. This is where I'm willing to move. These are my skills. That's how it lined to the job series. I'm going to start applying for 0085, or I'm going to start applying for 0200 because I'm a human resource specialist. And you develop your filters and then strong resume and then pump out the volume. That's what's going to get you there. That's what gets people there every day. You're not too old. Okay. All right. Good. Let's go. Let's go back to the previously submitted questions. All right. Next question. Tyler. I've had a few applications go to referred status since back in December, but there's no update since then. Is this normal? Should I reach out to the contact from the job posting? If it's been more than four months since you've been referred, there's a good probability that you're not, you, you were not referred. You're not getting referred for an interview. Unless you apply to a 12 month roster position or a public notice position that's open for a year and they periodically hire throughout that year. So I wouldn't reach out to anybody at this point. 
You don't want to reach out to anybody until after the interview. The exception to that is if you were not referred and you believe, so you received a not referred email, but you know you're referred. So you can contest that. That's the only time I would reach out. And you shouldn't be doing that too often, hopefully. Outside of that, you're going to wait until you get the interview request. Next question, my OB, what happens when you get another job during your developmental position? If you get another job, that's great. Take the job. If you're in a developmental position, let's say you're GS, GS7, 9, 11, you're in that developmental position and you have a job offer for GS11, you take the GS11. This would happen if you were applying to open to the public jobs because open to the public jobs are not bounded by time and grade rules. So you could do that. Um, a lot of people have a hard time leaving their agency, especially if they're in a developmental position because they don't feel like they fully matured within that position or they feel like they're betraying the agency. But if you have another better job opportunity, if that offer is in your email, then you need to go ahead and accept that offer because that's the best thing for you to do at the time. Next question. Sam Sims 100, what's the earliest age that someone can realistically retire from the federal government after 20 or 30 years, after reaching 20 or 30 years? For example, is it realistic to expect someone to retire at 50 with 30 years of experience, assuming I have no outside income and a million and a half in TSP? Okay, the earliest that someone can, this, this question has so many answers and we're going to go through it. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go through it. So check this out. This question, when can you retire? Most people here right now, they were born in 1970 or after. You were born after 1970 from the majority of you. That means you can retire at 57. That's what that means. Let's see, can I make this? That means you can retire. Let's, let's zoom it up a little bit so you can see it. So you can retire at 57 years old, 1970. Here's a whole bunch of, of, of caveats, right? After five years of government service, you can retire as long as you're 62. If you have 20 years of service, you can retire at 60. MRA means minimum retirement age. If you were born after 1970, 57 years old is minimum retirement age. So with just 10 years of government, you can retire at 57. But you can do it a lot earlier than that because there's something called early retirement. This is if your agency is experiencing a RIF, a reduction in force, or a reorganization. This could be offered to you. After 20 years, you can retire at the age of 50. You can retire at any age if you have 25 years of service during early retirement. This means that if you started working for the government at 18 years old, you could retire at 43, at 43 years old. So it's possible. Now, there's a penalty also. And here's another one that people don't really consider. Disability retirement, any age, 18 months. That sounds very enticing for a lot of people. Now, there is a penalty if you do retire um, with less than 30 years of service or you're under 62. They reduce your benefit by a certain percent, 5%. So if you retire at the MRA with at least 10 but less than 30 years, your benefit is reduced. So keep that in mind also. A lot of different times. Now, is it going to be enough? You asked me realistically, is it going to be enough? I don't know if it's going to be enough, but we can work through it. Let's check this out. This is DC. Let's say, I don't know, GS13. Let's say you're high three because it goes by high three right now. High three is, let's say it's 133 because, I don't know, you were the last three years of government service, you were a step four and then you were a step five for two years. So let's just, for simplicity, simplicity let's go for 133. If that was your salary. So what you would do is you would take 133,000 and you would multiply it by years of service. Let's say you work 25 years, 25 years of service. Then you times it by 1.1% and this is how much your pension would be. Your pension would be $36,000 a year if you did 25 years and you retired as a GS-13 in DC. And how much would that be a month? Well, every month your pension would be a little over $3,000 a month. Is that enough? I don't know if that's enough. If it's not enough, get promoted, become a GS-14, or do more years, do 30 years, 35 years. This number just keeps going up. It could be 4,000, it could be 5,000. This pension, FERS, is not as beneficial as CSRC. CR CSS CSRC was way more beneficial, but this is still good because you're taking this money 
and you're adding it to your social security. You're adding it to your TSP balance. So it's another another um, source of revenue, I would say. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. Let's see. Did I answer them? Do we have another one? Nope, let's, let's look at the chat real quick. Um, hey, that answered the question right here. What's the minimum age of retirement? We just talked about that. Uh, I might have missed a few, but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. SD, thank you for your response. How would an individual move from 05 to 0343? You would move by some slight tweaks to your resume. There are people I have directly assisted somebody recently go from a 0343 to a 0560. Because 0560 is budget analyst and 0343 could be program analyst. They both have the word analyst in there. You just need to focus a little bit more on the money aspect of it. So there's a lot of similarities. You want to change a little bit of the language and that's gonna help you. Um, what else do we have? Iron Danny 99 Good morning. I currently work as a target security, but I'm looking for a federal position with stable hours. What position or job series would you recommend? Target security. So you're security within the retail store of Target. Is that right? Okay, let's say that's right. What I would do, if you still want to work security, check this out. If you want to work security, we're going to go to series. We're going to look at the zero, 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 the quadruple zeros. And there's security in here. Uh, there's zero, zero, eight, five is security guard. But if you don't want to do that, maybe you worked other, there, there's security administration. I've seen people that were security guards go into zero, zero, 080, which is security administration. This is like physical security. This could be more in line of what you did. So you can look at zero, zero, 080. You can look at 0085. You can look at 0086. And you probably have a lot more experience. I'm just going off of what you told me, which is security. <laughs> so look at those three. And there's and then there's probably some more if you want it. If you want to branch out and look at different opportunities. It's really going to come down to where are you located? What town and city are you in right now? That's what it's going to come down to. All right, let's get rid of that. Thanks for the question. Another question. Lauren. Good morning, Lauren. Are there certain cities and states that have more need? Yes, there are. How do you find that out? You have to use USA Jobs. So check it out. Where, anytime you type in a location, it's gonna give you a, a, a mile radius around there. So for example, if we type in, let's go what everyone thinks about is Washington, DC. So there's, over 3,000 jobs within a 25 mile radius. This 25 mile radius, you can adjust it. You can make it go 30, 35, 40, however, however high you'd like. So that's in DC. So 3,500. Now let's look at Chicago. Chicago, 1,300. So DC has three times, almost three times as many government jobs as Chicago. Now let's look somewhere else. Let's look at New York. New York, New York. 1400. So New York has a 100 more jobs in Chicago, but still way less than DC. Is there a way, is there like a chart that you can look at and see immediately what area needs more government workers? Not that I'm aware of. You would have to go through manually and look, but the chances are you're only considering a few areas. You probably have like three or four areas that you're heavily considering. So you could do a comparison like that and see which one works the best for you. Or which one has the most opportunities? Next question, does federal job have retired age limits? They do for law enforcement officers. The retired, the mandatory retirement age is 57 for law enforcement officers. And if you're a veteran and you're a law enforcement officer, the mandatory retirement age is 60. But I've seen people in their 70s and I think even early 80s still working a federal government job. So a lot of government jobs that do not have an age restriction. Next question. I have a BS degree with three years of admin experience. I would like to know what GS grade I should apply to. And do hiring managers care about job gap? The federal government in general should not, and the majority of the time they do not 
care about a gap in employment. They care if you're qualified. Are you eligible? How qualified are you? That's what they care about. So you have to make sure your experience says that. You have three years of admin experience. That's what you would be using. Not so much the bachelor's degree. You would be using your experience. You would word it in a compelling way. And it depends on your area. Certain areas are more competitive than other areas. What GS grade would you target? I would first need to know the area, but without knowing the area, I would just tell you GS9 off the top of my head, probably, um, based on your experience. CSRS, yep, you got it. Fire red 2326. How would one how would someone transfer from 1811 to 2210? You would do it from your resume. You there's no other special way to do it. So you're 1811, so you're like um criminal investigator, special agent. You're going to showcase the times that you you did IT type tasks. Most 2210s they want you to have IT experience. Now, 2210s can mean a dozen different things. It can mean a software developer, a cybersecurity specialist, a help desk person, IT specialist. It can mean a lot of things. So if you're looking for IT specialist, you want to emphasize the time that you did IT task. When were you responsible or when did you lead an effort to update all of the operating systems in the office? And what was the effect of that? Did it improve efficiency? Did it improve effectiveness? Did you reduce the time that it takes to install the operating systems? Did you communicate and collaborate with software developers in order to improve their software? What experience do you have directly with the software that, they're, that they are requiring? So it all comes down to how you're writing your achievements. They're focused on IT, not so much criminal investigation, not so much the things you did as a special agent, but more with interacting with hardware and software. And that's really how you would do it. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of talk about education, right? Can you get a certificate in this? Maybe you should get a security plus comp TIA. It, mainly it's experience more so than certifications and education. The catch. Good morning. If you hold a certain series 0501, does that make you qualified for any 0502? Not necessarily. Check this out. Even if you are, let's say you're a 0340, right? If you're a 0340, you're qualified for that job. There could be another 0340 job in the same GS grade or even lower that has unique required experience under the specialized experience area. And you might not meet that. So you could be found not qualified, even though that is your job series. That's exactly your job series. And on the other side of the coin, you could apply for a completely different job series, but you have the right experience so you can get it. And the way that HR labels some job series sometimes is a little confusing. There is There could be a position that's a 2210, but they're not really dealing with IT at all. That, that position should really be in the 0300s, but they labeled it 2210, right? That happens too. All right, Morgan Jones, how may I market a Schedule A GS8 12 year master's in public? How would you market it? Okay, I believe you left a comment earlier, social service specialist in state government. So before to answer this question, there's another question. What job series are you targeting? Are you targeting social services? Because if you're targeting social services, that would be the, the 0, 100. Let me share my screen. So if you're targeting social science, that's the 0, 100. Are you doing that? Or are you targeting 0, 300? Whatever one, you need to first know, what am I targeting? Based on your exact experience within your resume, what are you targeting? After you know that, that is how you're going to start writing your achievements. You marketing yourself is you crafting and developing your achievements. Now, do you have any special hiring paths aside from Schedule A or is it just Schedule A? If it's Schedule A, really the first thing you should do is go to Hiring Path. You should click Open to the Public. You should click uh, Individuals with Disability because this means Schedule A. That's what this means right here. Click that. Do you have any other ones, any other special hiring? If not, then leave them blank. 
then you're going to look at your location. I don't know where you're at. This is New York, New York. Let's say you're in New York. You go down through here and you say, okay, I have social science experience. Do I want to try to attain one of these jobs? 0101. Is that where your experience aligns? Is it social work? Is it 0185? Or is it more admin? There's more admin opportunities, 0301. And then you would go ahead and, and select the ones that you feel your experience aligns with the most based on what you have accomplished throughout all of these years. After that, you're going to look at some of these job announcements. And then the keywords within the, within the job announcement is gonna help you and guide you on how your achievements should be structured and worded. So, I mean, that's how you're gonna do it. Let's go back to the previously submitted questions. Let's get rid of that. All right, question is from JPJP. Can an NH03 apply for an NH04? I'm considered a GS12 and the position is technically a GS14. So NH03 usually spans between GS12 and GS13 with the pay, right? But NH is a pay ban. It stands for Act Demo, Acquisition Demo. It's used in DOD and some of its sub agencies. So if you are in NH03, you can apply to an NH04. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is an NH04. This is in the Department of Air Force. You see right here, NH, NH4. If you go down to qualifications, it says applicants must have one year of the next lower broadband, NH03. So if you have one year as an NH03, you technically are eligible to apply to NH4, okay? So yes, you can do that. And NH, the pay band for people who do not know, it allows you to get steps faster, the steps work differently, and it allows for higher performance bonuses at the end of the year. That's what it does. Okay. Um, next question, R. Marquez, I'm in the private sector with 20 years of relevant experience. Agency A has given me a final job offer of GS-11 with a ladder to 12 and an EOD, which is entry on duty in three weeks. However, they're unwilling to offer a higher than a step one. This week, I received a tentative job offer from agency B, GS-12, and I accepted. Under the circumstances, I'm willing to accept the risk of tentative job offer versus final job offer. Any advice on how to decline the agency's final job offer? The best way to decline a final job offer is to email the human resource specialist who extended you the offer and politely tell them that you appreciate and you're thankful for the job offer, but you are declining it. You received another job offer. This happens every day. You should not feel guilty. You will not be blacklisted. HR understands. Hiring managers understand that individuals are always going to do what's in their best interest. So I would do that. Next question, Shanna, Shanna J. Are there tiers in government pensions? Average, moderate, high, or is there a set percentage taken out of your paycheck? How long before you're able to receive the rest of your life tenure? So the only federal pension right now that's available to government employees is FERS. The old one was CSRS, which was, was way better. The government was spending twice as much on that one, so they scaled back with FERS. FERS at first was a 0.8% or two in 2013. For the last decade, right now, it's 4.4% deduction of your pay. You're eligible, fully vested to get money for the rest of your life if you complete at least five years in the federal government. So that. Now, it could be a few hundred dollars. If it's a five-year pension, I, I believe I just did a video on a five-year pension. It could be a few hundred dollars, three, four, five, six hundred dollars, or it could be multiple thousands, depending on how long you spend in the government. All right, give me a second here. All right. Next question, Mr. Z, 14 years of law enforcement in New York in a similar job with the government, what GS should I try for? Yeah, 14 years of law enforcement in New York. Um, it depends on what job you're, you're, you're going after. You're in New York right now, so the GS grades can tend to be a little bit higher. 
Are you hoping to continue to be a law enforcement officer? In what capacity? Do you want to be a police officer? Do you want to work for a three-letter agency? Then another question would be, how old are you? Do you want to use some of your administrative operational experience in a new job? You can look at other job series for that. 14 years, New York, I would say I would probably would not accept anything less than a GS-12. You might be able to get a GS-13, but it really comes down to what exactly is on your resume? What is the experience on there? And is it relevant and speaking directly towards the job series? It would come down to that. All right. Let's see. What is this? Ian, in my for, in my former federal career, I was a 1550. Okay, that's 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 computer computer science and a 2210. Can you explain the difference? My undergrad degree was in computer science technology and the grad degree is information system engineering. The difference, like I was mentioning earlier, 2210 can be all over the place. Um, 1550 is a little bit more specific. Let's look at 1550. Um, and a lot of times this comes down to how human resources is, is labeling or coding the position. Sometimes it's coded in one particular way and they never change it. Even if it makes sense to change it, they don't change it. So it could be com confuse, uh, confusing. So you were 1550, that's computer science. Uh, most of these are considered engineer, scientist, position, computer engineer, computer scientist. And 2210 can mean a dozen different things. My, my guess is HR had that job listed as a 1550 and they never changed it, even though you could have been doing something that somebody in the 2210 job series could have been doing. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuances, even within 1550 or within 2210, there's a lot of nu nuances between the positions, but it's just the way that they're coding them. All right. This question is... Th is the GS table that was shown includes locality pay? The one I just showed was locality pay. Yeah, because it was DC here. Where is it? This one. You see locality pay right here, 33%. Almost every salary table you pull up will have locality pay. Even the rust, the rest of the United States, that will have a locality pay. To get one without locality pay, you have to type in like base you want GS pay scale base salary, and then it will have no locality. So yeah, that has locality. All right, let's go back to the previously submitted questions. Let's get rid of that. All right. We have ROI Trader who asked Armand, a list of common interview questions would be awesome to cover. There are thousands of potential questions. So, Here's the deal. If you're preparing for an interview, you want to focus on the job announcements, specialized experience and duty section. And that's where you're going to practice your, your potential interview. Uh, that's how you're going to prepare for your interview. I'm going to give you an example. Let's look at, what do we just have up here? We had an NH position up here. Okay. So let's look at this. This is a program manager. Let's say you had an interview for this job. You want to go down here to specialize experience and this is what they want you to have. They want you to have uh, experience planning, organizing functions, uh, meet customer needs. So an interview question could be like, well, sir, tell me a time where you were able to identify and meet customer needs. Describe an experience when you were able to do that. And then you would give them one of your success stories. There was a time where I improved the customer satisfaction survey rate by 10% quarter over quarter by executing this new process, whatever it is. So you could do that. Look and see what else is in here. What else? Managing, look, acquisition cycle. You should have a success story built around acquisition cycle. The question could be, please describe to me a recent experience in which you accelerated or enhance a pre-existing acquisition cycle. And then that's a softball. You're going to knock it out of the park because you have a success story strongly worded. And when you're creating these, say the interviews tomorrow. You should be typing them up today before you go to bed. Type up your success story. 
As you're typing in the words, you're reading it on the screen. It's helping it sink into your brain and then practice saying it a couple of times. When they ask you any question with the word acquisition cycle, that's gonna trigger your brain to go ahead and give them one of your success stories about how you were able to positively impact an acquisition cycle. And then we have something here, implementing program controls. I would pull out at least 10, if not a dozen, of these keywords and I would have a success story ready to give them. And if they ask me something that's not in here, but it's a behavioral or situational question, because most of them will be a behavioral or situational question, I would look for an opportunity to pivot and give them a success story. Now, you're not gonna always be able to do that because they're gonna ask you some questions about what are your greatest strengths? So it's gonna be a mix, right? You're gonna have some generic questions about what are your greatest strengths? What are your greatest weaknesses? Describe a time where you disagree with your boss. They're gonna ask you that. But m the, the stuff that's gonna count the most, I believe, is gonna come from the specialized experience. And then once you're done preparing for specialized experience, look at the duties, all right? Look over here. This is what the person who has the job is expected to do. So it's a great idea to show them that not only are you ready to do it, but you've done it and you've done it at a high level. So you're gonna look at that area too, all right? Contracting plans, budgets, there's just so many opportunities to develop good stories to speak to every one of these areas. Okay. All right, let's go. Next question. Next question is from Evan Anderson. How would you go from state government into federal government, are there preference for hiring? There's no preferences, but you can always leverage your past experience to qualify for many government jobs. There's over 300 government jobs. And what your background is, whether it was military, city government, county government, state government, that is gonna sit differently with each individual hiring manager. There will be a hiring manager review, reviewing your resume, maybe, Maybe they worked at a city government before. So you being city government, maybe that's a good thing. Um, there's a lot of subconscious biases that go into selecting an individual for interview and then once again, selecting them for the job. So it could work in your, in your benefit, but there is no current system or process to take somebody at a lower government level and to bring them in with preference, like a non-competitive hiring authority or anything like that. We got Yasel, he asked six questions. I'm gonna try to get through all six of these questions. Looks like we still got time. All right, let's 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 go ahead and knock them out real quick. First one, is the competitive service the only one that will grant you federal employee status for rehiring after three years of service? Yes, you're in the competitive service, three years, you become a status candidate. That can work in your benefit. You can leave the government, come back in, you can still apply for those competitive service jobs. You can't do that with the accepted service. You cannot do that with the senior, ex uh, senior executive service. Those two services, they don't offer that. A lot of people are shocked and surprised when they work in the government 20, 30 years under accepted service and they don't have any preference and they have to start once again applying to open to the public jobs. So yeah, it will make a difference. Next one, if I was a GS-12, step six with promotion potential to GS-13, what would my grade be going from GS-13 to GS-14 with the two-step promotion. All right, I'm gonna show you the two-step promotion rule and we'll go through that real quick. All right, this happens if you're already a federal government employee. This is the rule, two steps. It states that a GS employee promoted to a position of a higher grade is entitled to the basic pay at the lowest rate of the highest grade that exceeds his or her existing rate by not less than two steps. Does that sound confusing? The way that that's worded confuses a lot of people. I'm gonna show you what it means. This is the GS pay scale. Let's say you were GS 12. You were GS 12, step three, and you get promoted to GS 13. So what is your salary? What you do is you go from GS 12, step three, and you add two steps. So that's one step, this is two steps. This is 112,000 a year. Now look at GS 13. Where is it higher than G than 112? It's higher at step one. So you would be a step one. You would go from GS 12 step three to GS 13 step one. Here's another example. Let's say you're a GS 12 step eight, okay? Do two steps, that's 128. What would you be as a GS 13? What exceeds 128 on the GS 13? Not this, not this, not this, this one. So you would go 
from GS12 step eight to GS13 step four. That is basically what the what the two-step promotion rule means. That's how you can figure it out on your own. Okay. All right. Next question. In general, if you serve GS13 for a year, would this give you an edge to apply to GS14? It's not necessarily going to give you an edge, but it wouldn't make you eligible for a position with similar experience requirements. This will come on the hiring manager. There's some hiring managers that they don't want to hire a federal employee. They want some fresh talent from the outside because everyone that they've encountered over the last three years that were federal employees, they didn't like them. They had a negative view in their mind. They're like, you know what? I need someone fresh. So they want to hire somebody who is not a government employee. Depends on the hiring manager. What is the educational benefit if I decide to pursue a PhD? Almost nothing. There are some, <laughs> there are some jobs that might require it for the, you know, like, a, like a, what, like a doctor? archaeologist maybe but it's it's going to be limited and my general rule of thumb is i would not pursue a graduate level degree unless someone's paying for it who's paying for it are you paying for it you shouldn't pay for it is the military paying for it great is your agency paying for it great is i don't know you have a trust fund is that paying for it great but if it's coming out of your pocket i would not do it especially the way that government jobs are right now they're valuing your skills and experience way more than your educational attainment. So I wouldn't do it unless it's like, if you have a ton of money or if you're not paying for it and it's a personal goal that you've set for yourself, then, then okay, maybe consider it. Otherwise don't do it. All right. What agency ranks the best in the government when it comes to employee satisfaction? Is there a website? When you want to know what, and what agency ranks the best? There is a website. I'm going to show it to you. This is it right here. Best places to work. You see how it is 2022? This should be updated either this month or next month. Really shortly, this should be updated. It should say 2023. And when it does, I'll probably make a video on it. Here, their <clears throat> agencies are broken down. Large, medium, small, and then even smaller. You can see how each agency ranks. NASA has been number one for a while now. Let's go to, I don't know, let's go to Department of Transportation, see what they're up to. So you'll see how they're broken up into different categories from pay to teamwork to innovation to work life balance to recognition. And you'll see their score. So this is how you can look at each agency. If you're comparing a job offer from two agencies, you can look at that. Another thing you can look at, which is interesting, let's go to Department of Treasury. You can look at their trends. Check out Department of Treasury. This is where the IRS is at. In 2001, we had 138,000 people worked for them, and now 85,000. Look at the decline in the Department of Treasury over the years. It really went down all the way until 2018. 2019, then they started to ramp up. And the IRS is hiring. They're definitely hiring. You can look at demographics. Do we have more males, females? What are the races? You know, uh, how many Asians are working there? Pacific Islanders? All that information is available for you at this website. So check it out. Um, okay. What else? Oh, how can we demonstrate we had the four competencies like in our resume? You're doing it, like I just mentioned earlier, you're looking at the competencies or the specialized experience and you're finding a time in your past where you have experience directly related to that action and you're crafting an achievement. And hopefully it's result oriented and it's quantified. That's how you're doing it. Uh, let's look at the chat. Do we got anything in the chat? Uh, what is this? Uh, if I was offered a GS 12 step six and got promoted after a year to the next GS grade would my new GS, uh, we just kind of worked through that. I don't, are you in DC? Are you in the DC area? I can bring it up real quick and we can work through it again. You are a GS, GS 12 step six. So if you're in DC, GS12, step six. 
Okay, two-step promotion rule. That means we have to find where it exceeds 122. So that means, yes, you would be a step three. Is that what you asked me? No, you would be a step three if you were in D.C. Now, if you're in a different location, you have to do this on your own. If you're a GS-12 step six, that means you're earning 115 a year in D.C. So two steps from that would be 122. So we would find where on the GS-13 would it exceed 122, and it exceeds it at step three. Okay. All right. I see some remote jobs that state travel occasionally. Why is that? It could be a mistake, an error, or could, they could legitimately, they could legit want you to come into the office periodically. So maybe they want you to come in once or twice a year, and that's why they put it on there. Or it could be a mistake. There's no, no telling. Uh, next one. Why are all the hiring paths a veteran can apply to? What are? What are? Okay. <laughs> I thought you said why. What are? Well, let's pull up the thing. So check it out. There's just one, really. Well, that's not fair. There's more than one. Okay. So let's get rid of that. You're on usajobs.gov. You're going to hiring paths, which once again is the fourth one down. Hiring path. You're absolutely eligible to apply to open to the public. Anyone is with U.S. citizenship. You are also eligible to apply to veterans. This opens up a little over 5,000 more jobs. If you are a veteran, you could be disabled. You could be disabled. If you're a disabled veteran, then you want to go ahead and use your VA disability level. You want to use your VA disability letter, schedule an appointment with your medical provider, and get your Schedule A. And if you get your Schedule A, you're also eligible for this one, Individuals with Disability. And if you recently graduated within the last six years as a veteran, you can click Recent Graduate. If you're in the Reserves and National Guard, you can click that. If you were in the government prior and you have reinstatement authority, you can click special authorities. So this is pretty much the rundown. Hey, also, another thing is if you're a veteran, you have VEOA, and that allows you to apply to the majority of the competitive service jobs. So understand that as well. So that's what you should do. And you should do more than that, really. You have VRA. So there's coordinators that will work with you as a veteran to help place you. So there's VRA. There's 30% dis disability. There's a lot of things out there for veterans. Uh, next one, David. Do hiring managers care about GPA even if there's no positive educational requirement? No. I would say 99.9% .9 of hiring managers do not care about GPAs at all if there is no educational requirement. Or do they just care if you have a degree? Most of them don't even care about that. The only time anyone's going to care about that is if it's a requirement. Otherwise, they're going to be like, okay, great. What does this person, what can they really do? Oh, they have an MBA? Great. What, can, what have they shown that they actually have done? What are their achievements? You know, not so much what degree do you have. I have a low GPA. I wouldn't even list your GPA, but I'm seven years into my career. Yeah, you're seven years, man, you're way past that. I often say that your degree is great to help get you your first job. Outside of that, if there's no hard educational requirement, you're not leaning on your degree anymore. You're leaning on your experience. That's what's getting you the next job. Um, just give me a second. What else do we have? What does tentatively referred and referred mean? So tentatively referred, that's kind of like an eligibility email and referred means you were actually referred to the hiring manager, meaning that HR gave your, your name, your application to the hiring manager. That's what that means. How often do I do YouTube? I've been trying, listen, for the last year, I have done it on the last Sunday of every month. And it just so happens that here we are in March, 2024, the last Sunday of the month, fell on Easter. I didn't mean it to line up with Easter, but it did. So I'm going to continue to do them on the last, the last Sunday of the month. Now I am going to start doing an additional live stream, but that's going to be for uh, YouTube channel members and Patreon members, and also some of the supporters of the, of the newsletter. So for those individuals, I'll try to do a second uh, live stream. That's the plan. All right. Do I have any more questions? 
Let's see. Okay. Yep, we got another one. Janine Brown says, I'm an accountant with DOD. I recently got offered a job from the VA for an accountant position hybrid that I haven't accepted. VA offers plenty of remote jobs. Can I request to make the position remote prior to accepting the offer? Probably not. You probably can't do that unless the job announcement says remote. What you probably can do instead is I would inquire how often is telework authorized? Can you telework four days out of, out of five? Four days a week, can you telework from your house? Maybe have that conversation. That you can discuss with your supervisor after the job has started and you're, you can work in agreement with your supervisor. There are some situations that after you start working a job, you can request for it to be remote. There's a whole process and different approvals you need for that, but it's not typically done what you're describing as far as negotiating whether the job can be remote or not. I would continue to apply to remote work jobs. All right, uh, we're gonna wind down. Hey, listen, if you need more assistance, once again, we got the federal resume templates. Those are not really, those are templates, but there's examples in there that show you how it should be worded. Most people, when I look at their resumes, they're private sector resumes or they're resumes with a litany of responsibilities of, I did this, I did this. Great, you did it, but how did you do it? If you need help on wording it, then look at the federal resumes. The federal resume examples that's uh, in a link in the description below. Also, you can uh, sign up for the free newsletter to get the virtual hiring events. That's in the link down below. There's a course if you need more one-on-one -on -one type experience. If you need more, I would say like hand-holding experience when it comes to your resume, if you want me to edit it, to add comments and suggestions and to redline it and to have that dialogue with you back and forth, there's a course option for that. Or you can always call me, you can book a call down in the description below. And we have another one. Okay, I received, this is from Rami642. I received a tentative job offer for revenue agent IRS GS7 step one, 49,000 a year. I currently make 80,000. Can I negotiate to somewhere around 80,000? Uh, 17 years of experience. You can negotiate with your 17 years of experience. The federal government is going away from using your pay to match it. They used to match your pay or they try to match your pay as best they could. They don't want to do that anymore because they say that could be discriminatory. So instead, they're going to look at your experience. You're going to submit a memo. Once you receive the job offer, you give HR a memo showing why you're a superiorly qualified candidate based on all the years of experience that you currently possess. If you want an example on that memo, there's also a example in the description below. You click the link, you can download an example. That has helped a lot of people get higher salaries. A question from Seriously Leslie, do you know if there's any U.S. government jobs in Canada? When I do a search on USA jobs, all that shows up are remote work jobs. Thanks for your help. Yeah, there's a few, there's some jobs in Canada. You want to see some jobs in Canada? Usually it's the um, Customs and Border Protection in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, FAA might have some jobs in Canada. And I think what you have to do is you have to, you have to exclude your remote work jobs. So those don't pop up anymore. So we're going to type Canada, but before we do that, what I want to do is get rid of all these filters and then I'm going to select exclude remote work. We don't want to see remote work, but we're going to still type in Canada. And we're going to see what happens. We got 60 jobs. All right, we have FAA, FAA, yeah, a bunch of FAA. And then you should see some uh, Department of Homeland Security. The whole first page is FAA. There we go. You got Department of State. And you'll probably have uh, border, border Protection. DCMA. What else? TSA. So there you go. There are some in Canada, but they're not going to be a lot, you know, not at all. Okay. Interesting question, Canada. All right. Any other questions in here? Um, ba -ba -ba. Uh, okay. What is this? How long until they respond if I received on, what did you receive? A referral? So... Roughly speaking, you should get a referral, I would say one to three weeks after the job announcement closes, interview two to six weeks after the referral, two to six weeks. But there are sometimes the HR doesn't update the status, so it'll keep saying received and you will never hear referred or not referred. Don't get, don't get hung up on that. 
keep applying, keep applying, regardless whether you're referred or not, you should be mindful on referrals because that will be an indicator whether your resume is effective or not. But outside of that, keep applying until the interview requests come in. That's what you should do. Kyle, how can I get you to look at my resume? I'll look at your resume. Uh, I can review it. You, you can book a call down below and I'll review it and give you some feedback if you'd like. Uh, next question. Edward, is the interview has to be in person or Zoom? It's done a lot of different ways. Uh, before the pandemic, all most of them were in person where you actually had to go to the agency and wait. Since the pandemic, a lot of them have gone through uh, virtual. So not Zoom has been used. They've used Zoom. They've used Teams. I think the government prefers Teams. That's Microsoft Teams, and you can download it. I believe you could download it for free. Teams, Zoom. Um, I don't think they use Skype anymore. And there are some that are just over the phone, so there is no visual component to it. You're just talking on your cell phone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What else? Do we have any other questions? I don't have any on my end. If you have any questions, now is the time to drop them in the chat. If not, uh, if you have any video ideas, you want me to make a video to help answer some of your questions or to provide any type of assistance like that, put the video ideas in the chat or drop it as a comment down below. Thank everybody. Thank you so much for being here with me on Easter Sunday. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody's support. Anytime that you like a video, anytime that you watch a video, it benefits me and it means a lot to me. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoy your Sunday. Let's see. I hope you enjoy your Sunday. And I hope your Monday isn't too rough. So thank you so much. I will see you guys next month. <laughs> next month, last Sunday of the month. Sign up to the newsletter. All right. I'll see you guys.